Uh, welcome uh, to Parev TV. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is Emil Sanamian, who is a writer and commentator in Armenian, Azerbaijani, and the wider region. He is a senior fellow at the University of Southern California's Institute of Armenian Studies. Interestingly enough, Emil was born in Baku. Amid uh, anti-Armenian violence, he was forced to leave the area and found refuge in the United States. Uh, Emil and his wife, Oksana, uh, uh, were married in Gansasar in 2005. They have a daughter, Katya, and a son, David. Emil, there's much more we could tell, talk about you, but for the time being, let's uh, suffice with that. Anybody interested in your comments may check you out on the internet. Uh, honestly, I have lately been uh, talking to quite a few commentators, political analysts, and uh, it has been a very enriching uh, uh, program and exchange of ideas, and I'm sure you will add uh, to that. Uh, there are so many questions. We all have questions. No matter what you say, people will say, you know, Emil forgot to stress that. What did Emil mean by that? But let me start with every morning I wake up and uh, the news I check out and I check I'm impressed, news.am, guru. I hear of more bodies of young Armenian soldiers found in the fields. That is very, very disturbing. I also hear there are quite a few uh, prisoners who have not returned yet. What is your take? How many people have died in this war? Is it much more than what we think it is? Uh, it's hard to get the grasp of the situation. In the past, uh, we had uh, fairly uh, good confidence uh, that the Armenian governments in the past uh, would give uh, accurate information about uh, Armenia's losses and uh, both the territorial and, uh, and the human losses. You know, this war has been going on at a low intensity for a long time, not just uh, in the past year. Uh, but of course, in the past year, we've had the catastrophic uh, defeat uh, that is unprecedented in Armenian, modern Armenian history. Nothing of this magnitude happened in the early 90s. Uh, and uh, even if we look at the, the overall confirmed uh, numbers, and the confirmed numbers currently range uh, between 3,500 uh, 3,600 uh, dead, uh, possibly around 100 still imprisoned, uh, and an unknown number of missing. missing. Uh, the government officials uh, believe that, we claim that uh, uh, the overall uh, number of uh, dead will not exceed 4,000. Uh, so that's, that's the numbers that I'm operating uh, with. Uh, uh, obviously, when you have uh, a defeat of this magnitude, uh, you, you know, you have all kinds of uh, situations uh, that make it impossible to give concrete numbers uh, for, you know, considering the nature of modern warfare, where it's hard to find remains. Uh, sometimes you find fragmentary remains. You're not sure if they might be fragments of the same person, etc. So uh, it, it, there may be some fragments actually of uh, the other uh, sites or soldiers remains that are in Armenian custody and vice versa. So it's a, uh, it, that makes it just so, so, so much more difficult to get a co co complete grasp over the situation. But what's clear is that Armenia has never suffered defeat like this. Mm -hmm. What is clear uh, that the demographic impact of this war is actually going to be worse than the first war. Uh, because if we look at the people, uh, individuals who died in this war, uh, almost half of the Armenian uh, casualties uh, were uh, 20 years or younger, or basically were not unmarried young men. Uh, that kind of uh, loss did not occur in the early 90s. This is comparable to the earthquake of 1988. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's, that's what uh, should be kept in mind. You know, besides that, one of the areas that is really getting attention, a lot of attention, is the unblocking of transport communication in the region, joining Turkey to Azerbaijan, Armenia to Russia, Georgia to Iran. What do you make out of it? How, how good is it for Armenia in the long run? Well, in the long run, in a perfect world, everything would be open and there would be no issues. But mm -hmm. uh, of course, nobody lives in a perfect world. In the reality of that part of the world, uh, we still have uh, a, a great deal of... Uh, uh, distrust and animosity 
even after, especially after this war. Imagine, uh, yes, uh, 3,500 dead on the Armenian side, at least. It's a huge number. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a big loss. Azerbaijanis suffered very similar losses. So they're, they're uh, you know, are not necessarily uh, friendlier towards Armenians after this war. And they've uh, noticed that they can uh, take territory from Armenians and they can uh, do all kinds of nasty things towards Armenians and not uh, bear the price of it uh, internationally. So that's probably going to continue. Considering that environment, it's hard to talk about uh, transportation corridors or uh, issues like that that would, you know, make it, uh, uh, you know, uh, bring about a positive change. Positive change has to come politically first. Uh, considering what the discussions were about in the last uh, couple of months since the ceasefire, the ceasefire agreement stipulated that in return for uh, Russian control of the corridor between Russian-controlled Karabakh and Armenian Republic of Armenia, uh, basically Azerbaijan will have a corridor via Armenia yes. into Uh So what is the discussion right now is about that. Uh, is about uh, uh, Azerbaijan having uh, basically unfettered access, ground access to Nakhchivan. Currently, they do have ground access to Nakhchivan, but uh, via uh, Iran. So, if, for example, if you want to go from Baku to Nakhchivan, you can board a bus, but it would have to go over Iran and go into Nakhchivan, or you can take a plane, or you can go to Turkey and go that way. Uh, but uh, they want to have direct ground access. Of course, that would uh, make it things easier for them. And also, it would be another sign of political uh, gain out of this uh, war because uh, they are uh, there is there is some criticism uh, of Aliyev that he didn't go all the way, didn't capture the entire uh, area, let the Russians come in and made you know in, inserted that uncertainty about the the future of Karabakh element of uncertainty. Uh, so that's what the focus is on right now, is uh, Aliyev wants to get ground access to Nakhchivan, and also the Russians want to have direct uh, air uh, access into Karabakh and open the airstrip in, in Stepanakir to be able to resupply their forces there. You know, one of the more important things for Armenia is the economy, political stability, of course, and the economy. We always talk about the economy. Armenia is a country that is landlocked and heavily dependent on transit and tourism. We were so proud and happy when the numbers were going up in Armenia with the tourism. Uh, how can this uh, be achieved, uh, economic development, without uh, uh, transit, tourism, and peace and, and stability in the area? It's going to be very difficult. Uh, at this point, uh, not just the economic uh, underpinnings of Armenia's development, but generally, Armenia's statehood is very much in question. I think uh, what this war has demonstrated is that in uh, 30 years, Armenia, Armenia has not been able to accumulate uh, the intellectual, first of all, the intellectual capacity, and the second of all, material capacity to stand up for itself uh, as an independent state. Uh, because the, the reason I'm, uh, I'm saying stressing intellectual is that it was clear that uh, considering the, the material disparity, uh, Armenia would not be able to wage a war against the Republic of Turkey. And the Republic of Turkey basically announced its plans in advance, moved its troops in the theater, and engaged the Armenian army. Uh, all of those things happened in front of the world. Everybody observed it. Obviously, the world did not care much about what was going on there, but the Armenian government should have cared about it mm -hmm. and should have avoided this war uh, with uh, diplomatic effort and uh, all the other efforts that could have been undertaken. However, we didn't hear anything. Uh, and that tells me that we didn't hear anything from the leadership of Armenia or the diplomatic corps of Armenia. And that tells me that, yes, the political leadership very much incompetent, but there is also the, the issue of the Armenian institutions that they weren't able to address this uh, in, in, a, in a reasonable way. And uh, if you have that kind of uh, question mark over uh, statehood, uh, it's hard to talk about the economics in the sense that, uh, sure. you know, people will not have the trust in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the solution out of this is uh, increasing uh, uh, predictability of the situation in Armenia. And that can only be achieved in one, two ways, I think. Uh, one way is uh, to uh, restart the Armenian statehood project, which right now has been greatly uh, damaged, or uh, go towards... Uh, a more formal union with, with Russia, which is that's the only uh, the only uh, option available, and basically reintegrate Armenia into Russia in some shape or form, which would also increase 
uh, predictability of the Armenian situation, increase the investments in Armenia, etc. If we look at the history of Armenia, that part of Armenia, Republic of Armenia, previously, uh, you know, Erevan, Gubernia, or before that, uh, Armenska Oblast, uh, we've had great economic growth uh, in that part of the uh, part of Armenia from 19th century when it became part of Russia, uh, and through 20th century it was part of the Soviet Union. Uh, that created preconditions for an uh, you know element of independence and uh, independent uh, uh, political thinking, but it did not create preconditions for uh, an independent economic system. It, it's clear that Armenia is a, is a very small uh, market uh, that uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't uh, automatically kindle interest of major economic uh, powerhouses in the world. Just not, uh, not enough uh, people uh, you know, buying burgers and things like that. You know, even McDonald's is not in Armenia. So um, that's, the, uh, that's the situation that has not been fundamentally thought and addressed even bef before uh, this war, and now it's just going to be much more difficult. You know, let me move to a uh, more uh, political question. Uh, uh, the My Step Alliance is uh, considering, maybe I may be wrong, but considering the option of constitutional changes that will allow parliament to dissolve itself and call snap elections without the resignation of Prime Minister Pashinya. Of course, opposition doesn't like it. They would say, no, you should go first. We're, how do we resolve this issue of Pashinyan's uh, staying or resigning or being dismissed? Well, I, I would uh, note that uh, there, there is no such thing as uh, my step uh, thinking. I mean, there's, there are people who are loyal to Nikol Pashinyan. Mm. Uh, they have shown that it uh, doesn't matter to the extent to which Nikol Pashinyan fails, uh, they would just remain loyal uh, to their leader and they owe uh, their position as members of parliament, as uh, members of political establishment to him personally. So it's a, uh, the situation in Armenia uh, has not fundamentally changed since Sir Sarkisyan's resignation uh, when the Republican uh, party members were uh, basically owed their loyalty to Sir Sarkisyan and would not contradict him when he violated his promise not to uh, stay in power. Yeah. To stay in power, and they just they started to defend him and, and actually promote that notion. Uh, similar situation right now. So we have Nikol Pashinyan thinking of ways to stay in power. That's the only thing on his mind, from what I can tell. Uh, and uh, the way he wants to stay in power is to make sure that nobody, uh, you know, snatches power away from him. And because of the, uh, this current Armenian political system, uh, there's a possibility, say, if he resigns today uh, to trigger the new elections, uh, the parliament might just elect somebody else uh, in his stead uh, mm -hmm. from maybe within uh, the parliament or somebody allied with, the, uh, with them, etc., uh, so he's to the extent to which he's paranoid about it, uh, pushes him towards thinking of changing the constitution to make sure that if he resigns, no one else is going to get elected by the parliament and there's going to be an election. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, that tells you uh, the, the extent of the paranoia, but also tells you the, the fact that he would prefer uh, to sort of put the trust in the Ar Armenian electorate rather than the parliament, mm -hmm. uh, even the current parliament. So uh, it tells you that there are some issues uh, within parliament that are not publicly uh, uh, discussed, but uh, that, that exist. So uh, where we are right now is uh, it, it appears that he thinks that it would be better for him to have an election sooner rather than later to be able to confirm his mandate. You speak about people who are loyal to Pashinyan. One of them is Lilith Makuntz. And I'm sure you've heard that we all have heard that there is a possibility that she may be appointed ambassador of Armenia to the United States. What is your take on that news? Well, I have to say, um, Lilith Makuntz was one of the few members of uh, the uh, Nikol Pashinyan uh, political bloc party. Uh, she's currently the, 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 main, the, the head of the faction, uh, Nikol Pashinyan faction in parliament, which is a majority, basically, rubber stamp majority in parliament. Uh, initially, she appeared to have uh, uh, more of an independent streak than the majority of the other uh, mm -hmm. uh, members of uh, Nikol Pashinyan's team. She, uh, you know, would hold meetings with people 
uh, that we were seen as sensitive that other uh, members of uh, Nikol Pashinyan and Turash avoided. She made statements uh, to the extent that, you know, we're not going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're not going to go uh, in violation of the Constitution and the certain measures that Nikol Pashinyan was pushing, whether with the judiciary or uh, other aspects of, uh, you know, his uh, consolidation of power. So, in that sense, I, uh, you know, I, my initial impression of uh, Valerit Makuns has been positive. However, uh, of course, in the past uh, uh, six months, uh, it's hard to find anybody in uh, Nikol Pashinyan's entourage that would, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, maintain the level of credibility necessary to sort of uh, to to be able to uh, pursue any kind of policy or any kind of uh, um, politics even. Uh, so, of course, Nikol Pashinyan remains Prime Minister of Armenia. It's up to him who to appoint as ambassador, and uh, it's within his, uh, uh, within his uh, authority. Another person who is very loyal to Pashinyan is Anna Hagopian, his wife. She is in L.A. I'm sure you heard the news that she arrived at L.A. Why would she be in L.A. at this time? You know, I don't know exactly. I, I'm not privy to her travels. I know she was in Moscow uh, for a private visit just recently. Uh, it could be that, uh, you know, it's some um, sort of informal diplomacy uh, on the part of Nikol Pashinyan trying to rebuild some kind of support uh, in the main diaspora communities, because that's what it looks like. I don't know, maybe she's doing it totally uh, connected to her family plans. I don't know, her daughter, I think, maybe reaching college age so it could be related to that so um so there it could be just uh, that kind of personal uh, uh you know uh, thing what the problem has been with uh, uh nicole pashinyan is that yeah he doesn't trust a lot of people um so uh anna akopian was actually his envoy his informal envoy during the war in karabakh mm -hmm. uh, i heard some people say well at least he did send somebody <laughs> <laughs> and didn't completely stay out of it. But of course, as a commander in chief, he should have been on the ground and should have, he should have been involved in it rather than his wife. And if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the commentary that uh, Nikol Pashinyan engaged in during the war, it was just uh, totally not helpful. Uh, not helpful diplomatically, not helpful in terms of mobilizing, not helpful in terms of uh, informing the people of actual uh, reality on the ground. Uh, so uh, that kind of annoyance uh, that he generated uh, around him, not just annoyance, but m m harsher feelings towards him. Of course, they uh, they they try they kind of they spread towards his family members as well. But you know, uh, they're private citizens. Uh, they yeah. you know they deserve uh, I think some element of uh, you know uh, distance from uh, you know attacks, political attacks. You know, for the past few months, we have uh, conducted interviews with uh, very, very influential, uh, knowledgeable people. And th the main question turns around, what do we do now? Where do we go from here? Uh, you know, everybody wants a, a golden answer. We want the answer that solves all our problems. And so far, we haven't gotten that answer. What is your take? What do you think, in, you know, what does Emil think we should do now as we move forward? Well, if we look at it, look at the situation a few years ago, uh, I, uh, my sense was that Armenia was in a kind of a political deadlock. Uh, the, you know, the leadership of Armenia, Serge Sarkisyan, uh, was not doing a lot to move, move the country forward uh, in, any, yeah. in any kind of way. So uh, the protest movement uh, was something that I also uh, welcomed, uh, even though I'm not a citizen of Armenia, you know, in, in the small ways that I can influence people. I felt that it was a good thing that Serge Sarkisyan resigned. However, I never thought it was a good thing to hand over power to Nikol Pashinyan because I, from the beginning it was clear that uh, he was a very problematic uh, personality with a lot of baggage. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, Serge Sarkisyan made those two mistakes. On one hand, tried to stay in power himself, then hand the power over to Nikol Pashinyan. But now that he's been elected, we've had uh, this government and uh, the government has been nothing short of disaster. Uh, the, not just this war, and this war is, of course, the biggest disaster, but before that as well. I mean, it, the only thing of concern to Nikol Pashinyan was consolidation of power, making sure nobody challenges him, making sure, you know, he's got, uh, you know, everybody takes uh, his instructions, judges, etc. So 
that kind of leadership uh, is not something that I uh, uh, welcome. But after this war, I don't think uh, it's, 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 it's possible to expect anything positive from this government. So uh, we have uh, basically a default option. It's the old, the old government. Uh, yes, they, you know, there were issues about corruption, about issues of, uh, of their, uh, you know, undemocratic uh, behavior, etc. But at least there was some level, level minimum level of competency that they, uh, you know, maintain and to this day maintain. So that's, that's kind of the option that Armenia faces. Continue with the current incompetent government or default to the known, uh, you know, for its uh, failings, but uh, maintaining some minimum level of competence for former government. So that's that's the options. Uh, I don't see any other third option uh, realistically. And, uh, you know, it might emerge uh, in the future, but at this point, uh, those are two options. And another thing is uh, we've had uh, an experience where uh, people elect uh, and their choices are not necessarily to their own benefit. So that's that's another reality that you know there's been a major failure of uh, democracy in Armenia, mm -hmm. uh, not because uh, people are interfering in the, in the process, but because uh, there is a real problem in terms of uh, people being able to make informed choices. And we saw from our experience here in the United States that you know that kind of problem exists here too. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, if uh, we do have institutions in this country that sort of protect against uh, outside attack uh, in a sense that, you know, when you have a destructive uh, uh, personality inserted into the political process like Donald Trump in the U.S., in, in Armenia, you had uh, Nikol Pashinyan that, create, you know, left a lot more damage after, after uh, his living, still living a lot of damage after himself. You know, you speak about informed choices. Do we in the diaspora have informed choices? Well, we in the diaspora, um, it's just, uh, I, I, it's very hard to speak in general terms about the diaspora because we have uh, the elements of the uh, communities that uh, of Armenian descent that uh, have different degree of interest, different degree of involvement with Armenia. Of course, we have a, a substantial community that is directly involved, thinks about Armenia, reads news from Armenia, et cetera. Um, you know, I, 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 I have to say, though, that uh, there has to be an appreciation that uh, um, we are on the sidelines in this situation. So as long as we're not citizens of Armenia, living in Armenia, uh, all we can do is, you know, have the heartache and, uh, you know, um, yeah. post online. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's, that's where we are. Uh, we, have, uh, we have that uh, sympathy every once in a while. You know, we can answer a question to help somebody out, but that's that's where we are. Unless you are ready to sacrifice your uh, level of comfort uh, of, of life wherever you are, in Tbilisi or in uh, Moscow or in uh, West, whatever, uh, and live in Armenia, um, you are outside of this process. Um, that can change somehow, but at, at this point, I don't see... It's just not fair uh, to have the voice when you don't shed the blood for this country. Uh, we just had a war and uh, I don't know how many Armenian Americans participated in it. I don't think any, or, you know, I don't, I'm not aware of any. So that's what the uh, reality of it is. So we are on the sidelines of it. We are members of our own con uh, country's uh, citizenry. We have uh, our own uh, uh, problems in this countries and uh, of course, we, we will continue to talk about Armenia. We will continue to uh, hope that Armenia changes for the better, but we are on the sidelines of it. You know, whenever I look at the area, it's confusing because there are so many moving parts to the whole situation. We, we, we are definitely for Armenia. We believe in Armenia. We want to believe that the future is bright and all these other things. But I also always try to follow what Russia or Putin, is, what are their, what, how do they move? What do, what do they want from the area? What does Putin or Russia want in the area? Because they are the big boy there. No matter what we think, it's to an extent going to be what they want. To an extent. Yeah. It's, it, it's uh, frequently when you look at the big power decision making uh, from a small power, a small uh, country perspective, uh, there is a sense, oh, they know everything or they, um, you know, have a plan for everything. They don't. Uh, and primarily because it's too small for them. 
you look at it. You look at these things from Russia's perspective. They don't really care whether the Armenian Azerbaijani border lies. Yeah, but there is Azerbaijan next door with the oil fields, so the whole region of our country. Yes, bro broadly speaking, they don't want Armenia to disappear. Uh, but where Armenia Azerbaijani border is going to be, that's not uh, something that's on top of their mind. So. Uh, it's very important to what extent uh, the Armenian leadership and the Azerbaijani leadership can uh, bring their perspective to this uh, particular person, Vladimir Putin, to get him thinking in a certain way. So uh, we d during this war, we know from Putin's own uh, statements that were not contradicted and um, extent confirmed by P Pashinyan, from the day one, Putin tried to, uh, you know, stop the war. Uh, initially, you know, Armenian forces actually had some success. So you could say, well, give them another week, uh, see if they can counterattack and sort of, you know, stabilize the situation. But uh, as we know also from Armenian military uh, perspective, uh, by G chief of the general staff, it was clear that Turkish drones were just uh, shooting at Armenian forces from a distance that they could not be shot yes. down. So that kind of one way sort of slaughter, it's like, in shot Taburi type of situation before the genocide, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it, the war should have been stopped, and that there was a realization of that in Russia as well, and they were trying to stop it as early as uh, around October nine and ten, but you know, there was not uh, uh, there was not uh, on the one hand uh, readiness to do that, considering the political cost uh, from uh, Armenian side. On the other hand. Uh, there was a sense that Russians had some kind of nefarious plan and were distrusted uh, from the Armenian side. And uh, the notion was, well, if they want to come in, let them come in without realizing that for them, this loss is nothing. For the Armenians, it's a very significant loss, Absolutely. starting with the demographic loss, territorial loss, etc. So that kind of... Uh, uh, and uh, of course, there was not uh, even a, an effort from public effort from Armenian government to uh, get Russia involved in uh, in, in this conflict. Uh, they were satisfied with Russia's position, and this was just mind-boggling considering that Turkey was directly involved. And the whole point of their alliance with Russia is to make sure that Turkey is not directly involved. And anyway, so uh, Russian Russian position would have uh, oscillated between. Uh, point A and point B, depending on what kind of uh, incentives are created, uh, what kind of developments happen on the ground. Uh, we also know that even towards the end of the war, the Russians were actually trying to reach Nikol Pashinyan to try to get him to, to stop the fighting, because it was clear that the, the Armenian army has fallen apart and uh, the, you know, the Karabakh was about to be lost. So uh, in a sense, the Russians got involved in it and helped sort of stave off of a worse defeat for the Armenian. For the Armenian side. So uh, what has to be appreciated is that number one, uh, Russians don't think about Armenia on a daily, Putin doesn't think about Armenia on a daily basis. Number two, just because he has other priorities, he's got lots of other things going on. Number two is that his position would ev will evolve and has evolved depending on what kind of pressures uh, are there, even though they're, uh, they are sort of in built in uh, um, understandings that number one, Russia did not support Armenia when Armenia was fighting the war in the early 90s. Uh, in, in the sense that when the Armenians captured the Azerbaijani territories, Russians were against it. That's why you have UN Security Council resolutions because Russia also supported those UN Security Council resolutions. So that position was always there. Russia thought that Armenia should vacate Azerbaijani territories. Their position was, we're not gonna help you defend those territories. But, uh, they did get involved in the sense that, you know, uh, in, in uh, realizing that a Turkish supported Azerbaijani victory is not a good, is not in their interest. Uh, at the same time, they made clear that they would only get involved if Republic of Armenia territory proper is affected. And the Armenian government did everything to make sure that Republic of Armenia proper territory is not affected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a sense, giving Russia. Uh, an opportunity to not be well involved. So uh, that's that's kind of uh, um, uh, on the ground, uh, you know, uh, situational decision making that usually happens in conflict situations like this. So what what does what does Putin think about it in the future? It's clear that he is interested in uh, um, in some kind of presence, military presence in Armenia and Karabakh and in Azerbaijan for the long term. What does that really mean? 
uh, that will evolve. Uh, there is not, uh, you know, a clarity of that because, it, uh, you know, uh, uh, they they want to make sure that uh, Russia is perceived as a great power and the main power in this part of the region. But they, it's also clear that technologically they're outgunned uh, by the West and by uh, Turkey. Also, uh, it's also clear that uh, that uh, they've acceded to Turkish presence in in this uh, South Caucasus region. Mm -hmm. Now, what is Turkish motiv motivation? We can get into that too, but it's clear that. This is the second uh, theater, second theater for Russia-Turkish competition, confrontation, in addition to Syria, where a Russian sort of a Russian presence in Syria was really, really unnerving and problematic for, for the Turks. And I'm sure uh, this sort of Turkish presence in a similar way, uh, problematic for Russia. You know, you're in Washington, D.C. Just tell me, what do you think is happening with the American policy uh, uh, in the area. What is their next move? What can we expect from the Biden government? Well, uh, it's clear that there, you know, there are going to be a lot of rebuilding. Uh, and the main uh, direction of rebuilding is going to be with the European Union, uh, with Britain directly, now that it's not part of the European Union. And also, I think with Turkey, they will try to rebuild the relations. Um, in the sense that you know, they will try to bring Turkey back into anti-Russia alliance. That would be their, uh, their mm -hmm. priority. Um, because uh, from uh, you know their perspective, from uh, U.S. government perspective, Russia is the biggest problem uh, for the U.S. Uh, has created and will continue to create problems, uh, and it's the you know a challenger. Of course, there's also China, and uh, they they see this sort of uh, Russian China Russia China alliance uh, that mm -hmm. you know you know block that uh, that is the biggest problem. So they will focus on that. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these other min minor issues, uh, you know, I'm not sure, even sure that Armenia graduates to a minor issue, you know, in their in their minds. Of course, there is the Armenian American community, but I don't see it uh, influencing uh, decision making process here much at all. I looked at uh, the initial, uh, you know, commentary by uh, Secretary of State uh, nominee uh, Anthony Blinken. I didn't see much difference between what he was saying and what. Uh, previous government was saying. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're going to throw in some humanitarian aid. That's basically it. Yeah. Uh, Emil, what is interesting about your background is that you were born in Baku. And I'm sure you and your family have gone through very unique experiences. Uh, how has that influenced you in what you are doing? And tell us about more about yourself. How can you capsule your life? Who are you? Uh, you know, yeah, I am a, I am in a kind of a, a weird uh, category because uh, being born in Baku, I grew up, um, you know, with an Armenian name, but that was the extent of my Armenian interests, uh, that and also Ararat uh, Football Club. Um, and uh, because of this conflict, uh, I sort of became interested in what uh, what is going on. Why are we leaving Baku? I was 12 years old at the time. How old were you didn't... when you left? How old were you when you left? 12. 12 years oh, old. So you, you, you know about life there, yes. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I liked Baku. It was my, you know, my grandparents were born there. It's, uh, you know, we were there pretty, uh, pretty for, you know, for several generations. So it was uh, that experience. But also we, after Baku, we lived in Moscow. Uh, and it didn't feel like, uh, you know, uh, you know, we didn't feel like refugees in a sense. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't end up uh, in the worst, sort of uh, place to live or worse place to live or didn't experience a lot of hardship. We did experience economic hardship. Of course, mm -hmm. in, the, in the Soviet Union, people weren't that rich to begin with, but when they lost uh, property, when they lost uh, jobs, it was very hard to rebuild. Uh, and of course, this was also the period of dissolution of the Soviet Union when you really didn't uh, have uh, safety nets anymore. Sure. So uh, we had an opportunity to uh, emigrate to the United States as refugees from Baku, uh, even though we didn't maybe feel like refugees, but we were in fact refugees. And uh, we lived, we, we moved to the United States in 1992 and I grew up here, of course, at a distance. Uh, I continued to uh, study Armenia. Uh, for the first time I went to Armenia as an adult uh, in the mid nineties, early mid nineties. Um, and, you know, participated in some volunteer organizations, et cetera. So uh, 
then I came to Washington to uh, study. And of course, I came to Washington to study because I knew of, uh, of Armenian advocacy here and I wanted to participate in it, and I did. And I wanted to uh, work for the Armenian Reporter for a number of years uh, before it closed. And uh, now I work with the USC, uh, which has an Armenian Institute, and one of the few institutes that uh, focuses on contemporary Armenian issues rather than uh, history or Armenia or Turkey or other places. Um, so, of course, uh, this experience that uh, that I that our family had had informed you know my interest in uh, in uh, in uh, in, uh, in the a Karabakh conflict in um, Armenia, and uh, uh, to this day, uh, it's very hard to uh, disengage from it. Even though you know the, the, the life goes on, and uh, you know that I've uh, lived in the United States for uh, close to thirty years. Uh, is it? Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be thirty years next year. Yeah, we all have so, the same story. Let me ask you: Do you have any Azeri friends? You know, I, I, I am uh, very picky in terms of who I call friend. Uh, I do have uh, people of Azerbaijani descent that I socialize with, yes. And, and can you, do you know what they want? Do you know in terms of what, is there- It's a, a lot of different people. It's a lot of different people. We I, have- yeah, uh, Is there a common ground anywhere? There is a common ground? Yeah, there's a common ground with some people, but really it, it ends up not being uh, important because, uh, you know, uh, Azerbaijan is a, is a very established tyranny where you have a one man rule, one family rule. Uh, of course, the biggest issue for them has been uh, the loss of prestige over the war. They wanted compensation in terms of, you know, uh, revenge. And that's why you see uh, so much gloating and so much, uh, uh, you know, uh, barbaric behavior, uh, killing civilians, etc. Uh, that has been become sort of part of the uh, uh, the identity. Uh, this uh, and you know it, it didn't just start in the in the late eighties, early nineties. Um, the the formation of Azerbaijani identity uh, was very much a response to Armenian nationalist resurgence. Mm -hmm. uh, so when the Armenians started to create political parties, uh, when they started to organize, uh, Azerbaijanis were observing it first in Tbilisi and then in Baku, uh, and responded uh, to creating their own parties, literally within years of Armenian parties being created, creating their own self-defense, uh, creating their own ide identity. Um, so the uh, Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict is very much uh, part of Azerbaijani identity uh, mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a group, uh, you know, that coalesced in the 20th century. One thing, one thing we should also stress is that uh, in Armenia we were able over the past 30 years to found democratic institution to bring about democracy more so than in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan has still kept that autocratic dictatorial regime which I'm sure there are many Azerbaijanis do not agree with Aliyev. That's another thing they have to solve. But last question I have is uh, a comment that was uh, made by Eric Hagopian. I'm sure you've heard of Eric Hagopian. He yes, says, before taking on the world, uh, he says, we need to make, take a measure of ourselves and understand our collective shortcomings. You know, we also have problems just as anybody else. And how well, do we absolutely, address yeah, absolutely. Is enough being done to address these issues? Uh, well, of course not. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's a uh, it's a problem that's uh, inherent, I think, in a lot of uh, societies and a lot of groups. Uh, it's very hard to be self-critical and be politically successful at the same time. Uh, so you know, uh, it 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 uh, it's it's hard. It's it's hard to be uh, honest about yourself, and uh, um, that's I think a reality everywhere. What the problem is, uh, I think, in Armenia, uh, it's not about. Uh, primary problem. It's not about that. It's not about corruption. It's not about uh, uh, even, um, you know, uh, immediate military problems. But the size of the country is only uh, 3 million people. Yeah. Uh, it's geographically cut off from everywhere. So that kind of uh, starting uh, problem uh, is very, very hard, hard to, to address. So uh, the solution is to uh, reinvent the, uh, the notion of what it is uh, the Armenian state is for, 
if you don't have enough uh, resources, you find a way to expand your resource base. So if you can't sell, you know, Armenian enough Armenian flags, you start selling some other flags too, <laughs> in a sense, uh, to be able to make a to make a living. I'm going to use so, that. I'm going yeah. to use that in the future with other people. <laughs> Uh, Emil, anything in closing? Because I really am enjoying talking to you and there's so much we can discuss. But anything in closing you'd like to wrap? Uh, well, you know, it, it has been a very traumatic experience. Uh, I personally uh, have stopped talking to some people. <laughs> so I would only say the following. Um, uh, we really need to uh, have at least some basic uh, minimum understanding of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And uh, of course, it's up to the citizens of Armenia to decide this. But what this government in Armenia has shown in the last two years is that, uh, you know, it's it's a it's a it, it's a really really important to have that minimum competency level to be able to uh, take decisions that affect so many lives, so many livelihoods. And uh, the, the, the extent of the tragedy that uh, the Armenian people have lived through, I don't think has been appreciated, even in Armenia itself so far. Uh, and in the diaspora, of course, uh, we, uh, we sometimes maybe focus on, uh, on these issues even more uh, than uh, people on the ground. But uh, again, uh, I do think that we need a fundamental rethinking of what the purpose of the Republic of Armenia is, uh, how to uh, make it a purpose that can be achieved and uh, to maintain the Armenian identity into the future. Emil Sanamian, thank you very much. There's nothing else I could add. I really appreciate uh, your comments, your candidness, your brilliant uh, ideas. And uh, I hope we can meet again and have another discussion sometime soon. And thank you for again your time. Thank you very kind to me and thank you for having me.